Hi, this is Nicholas Vince, star of Hellraiser 1 and 2, and Nightbreed, and star, well, featured player. Um, and I'm ch chatting with Sean Evans on Back to the Movies. I just want to say thank you very much for joining me. I mean, it's very much appreciated. And as to not break tradition, here is a tied, tried and tested question you may have answered a million times before in your career, Nick. So, <laughs> so let's uh, get this one over and done with. What made you want to pursue acting and how did you get started? Um, according to my mother, I was always a show off. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I mean, I really started, you know, primary school playing the third king in the school nativity play and then I starred in Peter Rabbit at school when I was oh seven eight years old um, then went into amateur dramatics and did dozens and dozens of shows before going to drama school fantastic I can definitely imagine you on the stage there playing the king I remember back in my school days I played um, they had no roles for me as the three kings so they decided to make up one called Artiban and threw me in as the fourth king on his way to Bethlehem to visit baby Jesus <laughs> did you did you have to wear a really flowery dressing gown it was like a very strange velvety veil sort of thing and f for some reason it, I ended up having like the most to say so there's me as like an eight-year-old kid trying to memorize a full script <laughs> and we had, we had like five shows in a row it was crazy it gave me a little insight into to kind of like the the things you have to do as an actor i'm sure you know full well the trials and tribulations <laughs> of being an actor yeah well, i think the, the the most memorable point was uh, in that very first time when i was playing the third king as i walked onto the stage my youngest brother who was in the audience screamed out oh look there's nikki which kind of brought the whole thing to an entire stop um, because I just, everyone just fell about laughing, basically. <laughs> That's when the serious of the play kind of disappears. And, yeah. Oh, my identity is revealed. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So, I mean, um, for those who don't know, Nick, he what, played a Cenobite in Hellraiser, covered head to toe in makeup. And, I mean, the process of uh, being dressed up in makeup must have been uh, extremely laborious. I mean, how relieved were you the moment that that makeup came off and you were able to breathe oxygen again? <laughs> <laughs> I was very relieved. I think, I mean, it wasn't just being able to breathe. It was, you know, being able to hear, speak, see. Um, all those things, because when I was wearing the chatter and makeup, I couldn't do any of those things. Which is why when we got on to the second movie, I was very relieved they changed the chatter and makeup so that it actually uh, revealed my eyes. Um, kind of unexplained in the second movie in the final edit. But, uh, yeah, so uh, that was very, very good. And, of course, as Kinski, um, that was a different thing because um, I had five hours of makeup to go through. But at least I could hear, speak and see. I love Kinski. It's like, what's going on with the chin and the forehead? It's like doing like a half moon kind of shape thing, isn't it? It, it is. I don't know quite. I mean, basically, this was a very much last minute decision because the character in the book is Jackie. And Jackie is described as having two faces and two personalities molded into the one face. Um, but they just couldn't make that makeup work. So you do see it. Funnily enough, it's in the opening sequence of Nightbreed. You see that makeup running through the fields and so on. Um, Otis and Clay, I think, is the official title. Um, and then it was a kind of a last-minute decision. Giant Clive just sketched a crescent moon face on a piece of paper and handed it to the makeup guys, and they came up with this. Um, and then during the filming... I was given a little figure, um, which I don't happen to have to hand, but of Mac tonight. Americans will know what this is, and I don't think we ever had um, it in the UK. Kind of very much the inspiration, I think, of Mac tonight. It was a crescent moon, uh, crescent moon faced guy, played by Doug Jones in the original adverts, apparently. Oh, right. Fantastic. What a small world, because I know that you know Doug personally and uh, Sabe here and. Uh... Yeah, that's a very yeah. <laughs> strange how this whole horror kind of community just kind of collaborates and any name you just pick out off the top of your head and somewhere along the line, anyone who's re related to horror will be like, yeah, I've either worked with him or I know him or I've done this with him. It's a very small sort of family built community, isn't it? 
It is, absolutely. It's funny enough that something was mentioned uh, in my interview with Eileen Dietz at the weekend. She was saying that in Los Angeles, because she kn- I was reeling off some names, she knew you, she knew Jessica Cameron, she not worked with Jessica, but she just said in, you know, in hot Los Angeles, um, there is definitely a communi- community of um, horror filmmakers. Yeah, definitely. And going back to, to what you said about how Razor and the makeup obviously making your eyes so you're able to see a little bit better. I mean, how was it in the first movie? Because obviously vision was very restricted and the house had very steep staircases. How did you manage to get up and down and around set, you know, without these accidents? Um, they basically, oh, it was very interesting. They took me by the hand. They literally led. I always had somebody with me at any given moment. There was always somebody with me. So if someone um, had a pet Cenobite on the set of Hellraiser. Yeah, yeah. So basically, I just kind of led around by the hand. <laughs> I just and same for Simon Bamford as well, because once he was in makeup and costume, he was saying. But of course, the scenes in the torture chamber that wasn't too bad because that was just a short flight of set steps because that was filmed in the studio uh, over at Cricklewood, the production village. Um, that very steep, twisty, uh, narrow staircase in the house over at uh, Dollis Hill, uh, we didn't have to go up those too, ma- too many times. Right, now, I was going to say, I mean, what, what are you talking about, Hal I mean, I've seen in so many interviews how you talk so passionately about it. Obviously, it's a big part of who you are now. I mean, mm. um, did you ever think it would get as big as it did? And I mean, even now, people are still coming up to you at conventions like, can you sign my photos? Can you sign my photos? Do you ever, do you ever like, hit like that reality barrier, so to speak? Right? It's like, <laughs> how the hell is it, you know, got this far? Something I realized the other day, I mean, no, I had no idea. I don't think any of us did. We just knew that we were working with Clive. He was extraordinary. Um, and what we were doing was very fresh. Um, there was nothing like Hellraiser uh, when it came out. And one of the lines I coined is, no teenagers were harmed during the making of this movie, um, which was really set it apart because all the other horror stuff that we tended to see, Halloween, Nightmare on Elm Street, and uh, Friday the 13th, is all about stalk and slash, is all about killing teenagers. Um, so that it, we knew it was very different. I did realize the other day I have now become accustomed to the idea that people might tremble when they meet me. And you just, <laughs> you know, they come to a horror convention, they know who they're going to meet. They may even, you know, stood in line for 10, 15 minutes waiting to speak to me, and they will still physically tremble when they come to meet me. And, I, and that is just the power of that makeup. Um, So that's extraordinary to me. That's fantastic. I think you should definitely take some hooks with you to your next convention (laughs) and just really, you know, get that positivity (laughs) assured. (laughs) For everyone waiting in line, you're just there standing with a few hooks. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I've not thought of that. Probably won't. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Health and safety problems. Well, just, yeah, that's just what I'm thinking. Yeah, I don't think I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. I I could see that becoming very unpleasant. (laughs) Now, up and down the internet, there are rumours across the landscape of the horror realm saying that Hellraiser remake is still on the cards. I know that a script had been written uh, and it's still been processed on its way to pre-production. But say if Clive called you up and said, right, Nick, we want you to play a Cenobite and reprise that role, would you say yes? Or what would your thoughts be in regards to like a a remake? I, I... I mean, firstly, I'd say hell yes. If Clive asked me to do anything, I would, you know, that's the thought of being able to work with Clive closely again is just a joy as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, just being around him is just inspiring. Um, the idea of a remake, I mean, Clive has written the script, so, and it's Clive's baby. I, it's very interesting as we approach the publication of the Scarlet Gospels, uh, where, you know, this is Pinhead's End. Um, apparently. I haven't read any of it yet. I, I notice you can get to the first two chapters free online at the moment. And it's like, no, I don't want to do that. I'm just going to wait for May and I want to be able to sit down with my nice book and I want to be able to sit down and read it cover to cover when it comes out. Um, it's Clive's baby, you know, and he should be able in child, if you like, a teenager, more than a teenager, he's an adult now. Um, and he should be able to do what it is he wants to do with it. So good for him. Yeah, definitely. I always like it when the original creators are, are willing to do the remake because you know you've still got that you know original creativity without someone else taking over and kind of spoiling it. I mean, did, what did you think of other said remakes in the horror genre? Is there any that come to mind where you think, oh, that was an abomination? Uh, yeah, funnily enough, I was talking about this the other day on one of my shows and we were looking at um, Fright Night 
Sorry, <laughs> just I love the original Fright Night, and I think the people, the actors in the remake of Fright Night, are definitely uh, very talented people. But oh dear, what were they trying to do? Well, I know what they're trying to do. They make it trying to make it into a teen high school movie. Um, bizarre, completely and utterly bizarre. I think you're absolutely right. I haven't had a chance. I'm, I'm sitting down to look at the Evil Dead remake uh, in the next couple of weeks. Um, and people have been very positive about that. And I think in terms of remakes, it depends. I think there's two things that make it successful, i.e. you get the original creators involved, as they did with Evil Dead, or you do what they did with The Fly. They made a very good version of The Fly with Vincent Price. And then you got David Cronenberg, who took the original idea rather than the original story. And just really played with it and, ran, and took that ball and ran with it. And I mean, obviously, Cronenberg's a genius as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, he, his idea of body horror and really bringing that to the fly, I thought was superb. So I, I think those are the two things you need. Either the original creators or somebody n new who is not going to remake as opposed to reboot or rethink or revisualize or do something new with the material. Yeah, I totally agree with you, and uh, I'd love to hear your opinion of the Evil Dead when you get around to it. Because I personally thought it was it was it had a nice homage to the original. It had that nice sort of vibe to it. It was it was very dark, you know. It was it it kept true. It kept true, which is a lot of uh, where remakes kind of go wrong. I mean, look at Nightmare on Elm Street. I bring it up every time. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't brought. I watched Nightmare on Elm Street for the first time. Uh, recently, just because I thought you know, it's a long time. I mean, I remember when I saw it originally, I, when it first came out, and I was with a in a cinema, and it was in the days when I was working in front of a house in a cinema, and a young lady who was going to volunteer to usher said she wouldn't see it by herself, and we had no other tickets sold, um, but we had to show it because we'd advertised it. So I said, fine, I'll go in with you. It's not a problem at all. I'll sit with her. Within 10 minutes, I was holding on to her as much as she was holding on to me. <laughs> I just, it's just it's brilliant. It's absolutely superb nightmare on Elm Street. I think, why? Why are you bothering? Well, I mean, obviously, I know why you're bothering. You want to make money, and it's an easy sell. Um, so, yeah, that's obviously the reason why people do these things. Yeah, it makes me cry inside, Nick. It just makes me mm. cry inside. You watch all of them films and you're growing up, you know, loving them films, and then they go and completely obliterate your childhood dreams. <laughs> I, so you, you see, I, I find it really interesting because the, the passion and our attachment to things, it's like with, me, with songs. If you fall in love with a song by the original artist or even just the first time you hear it, it could be a re released the first time you hear it. That initial experience becomes part of your life. And then when somebody either does a, a cover version of it or you hear the sometimes you hear the original artist's version of it, it's, it's wrong. You know, it feels wrong. It's very disturbing because somebody, exactly as you've just described, they're rewriting, you know, they're rewriting your childhood or they're rewriting your teenage years. So I think I completely understand how people get so passionate about stuff. But what happened the other day was I mentioned uh, to somebody on the train, and the strangers I've met on the train about The Fly, and uh, you know, I was talking about the remake of The Fly, and they said, oh, you mean they're going to remake the one with Jeff Goldblum in it? I thought, oh, well, that kind of makes sense, because that person, the first one they'd seen was the Jeff Goldblum. They're just completely unaware of the Vincent Price one. <laughs> wow, very strange, very strange indeed. I think it's like human nature to kind of, you know, people fear change. So if you kind of set in that routine of, of loving what you do love originally and something comes along that's similar, but it's not quite got that sparkle, then you're always going to, you know, have your loyalty with the originals and, and never with any remake or re-release or re-recording you know, or whatever your passion may be. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, it's interesting, but I think it, it is, you know, it's always gone on. There's always been remakes. In fact, have you ever, have you ever heard of a, mu a movie called Gaslight? I haven't, no. Ah, this is a black and white version. Um, funnily enough, Vincent Price was in the original stage version. Um, but it was made in the UK uh, with Anton Walbrook. And then six, seven years later, they remade it in Hollywood. Uh, with, uh, I'm trying to think of a lady, but she won the Oscar for it. Um, 
and it is, it'll come to me later on. Um, so it's not a new phenomenon. I'm talking about the 1940s when uh, Gaslight was originally made. And, you know, you're always going to read, uh, perhaps because the truth is there are just so few stories in the world, uh, you're always going to come back to the really good ones. Yeah, I mean, uh, I was just going to say, um, g going back to, to what you mentioned about, about conventions and uh, obviously meeting the fans and, and things like that, I mean, it, as well as it being such a wonderful experience, I mean, what's the craziest thing like a fan has ever done for you, whether it be a, a crazy tattoo or has someone gone the extra mile? Um, it's interesting. I remember the first time I saw a tattoo of Chatterer going that is strange. I, but I also remember the first time that Clive ever saw a tattoo of Pinhead on someone. This is back in the 1980s. Um, and he just found that extraordinary. And I think I do as well. Because this shows amazing dedication. Um, it's slightly bizarre. I get asked to sign these. And then people get... So I know there are tattoos of my signature uh, in the world. Um, that's a very strange feeling as well. But again, I'm just terribly grateful. i you know, just very grateful to be involved in this and remarkably lucky as an actor to have been involved in something that's become so iconic, the whole Hellraiser world and, and franchise. Uh, just amazing. Yeah, it really is a, a true testament to, you know, that it shows the film stands the, the test of time and um, people are still probably to this very day someone in the world right now could be getting a, a chatter a tattooed on their arm just waiting for your signature now. <laughs> yeah it's very true and every so often they'll post photographs of these wonderful things they've done and that's the thing that's changed over the years as well is that tattoos have become really photorealistic the colors they manage to get these days and it's been quite fascinating to me to watch the quality and the design of the chatter tattoos and you know, the other cenobite tattoos that i see <laughs> yeah, I, I know when, when you're saying all the different colours and stuff, I'm just thinking I'd never get a tattoo. I'd end up looking like the Joker, the new Jared Leto <laughs> picture released. I'd just be a complete mess. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I am just too hairy. People do ask me, so when are you going to get one, Nick? I'm not ever. Um, I'm too hairy um, and I don't like pain. Uh, the thought of actually doing this willingly uh, is just completely bizarre as far as I'm concerned. I'm deepest respect for anybody who has tattoos. And I, I think they're fascinating. Um, and I think they can look extraordinarily beautiful on people as well. But no, not for me. Never yeah, for me. Not for me either. I think we're going to stick to those tattoo sleeves that you just pull over your arms and it makes you look as though you've got a tattoo. <laughs> I think that's the future for us, me, me and you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, except you'd probably have, yeah, except the hair would still stick through on my arms. I know. <laughs> it just oh, that's the an illusion. image right there. That's yeah. an image. That, that's like basically saying that if you shave Chewbacca, he's like covered head to toe in tattoos. <laughs> that's a great image. I love that idea. I wonder if he's got like a like a galaxy map or something all over his body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, that would be interesting. We need to get some sort of hashtag thing going viral, like please shave Chewbacca or something it's, 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 it's see how far we get to. shave Chewbacca yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sure J.J. Abrams could think of some cool ideas of what could be underneath yeah yeah no absolutely now every time me and you speak Nick I'm always intrigued by what's behind you I'm a very keen prop collector especially movie props and memorabilia and I noticed some pretty cool things behind you there as well um, <laughs> first question is could you list some of the items that are behind you there and secondly did they let you keep anything from production um, some of the things behind me is I have got, I don't know if you can see it, this is one of my favourites, I have to say. Um, I, was, I don't know if you can see that, but that is my second book of short stories, Caged, in a piece of wood, that was done by um, a Belgian friend of mine who's a uh, blacksmith. What if you really wanted to read it? <laughs> I've got I've got other copies. I can get them. <laughs> That's right. Um, otherwise, we've got the uh, glow in the dark chatterer uh, that was done by that would be Screaming. Uh, that was Screaming Products. Um, I had it painted up, and he covered up um, the uh, glow in the dark bits. So I got him to scrape those off uh, for me. Um, and I've got a chatterer bunny as well um, that was done for me, who I just think is wonderful. Um, <laughs> <laughs> great things, and also the 
Kirsty Cauldron. This is the number one. I can't remember the name of the artist. I really should. But I think many people might actually recognize this particular style. I just think that's great as well. Um, did I manage to keep anything somewhere around? I have got a tiny little piece of leather from one of the costumes which I had, but I, I think it's disappeared. It was attached to a teddy bear at, at one stage. Um, and that's it. But otherwise, no, no. All the costumes were held on to um, and then reused or had to be recreated. because they Actually, no, the costumes are in the hands of Collector, as is the original Chatterer mask and Butterball mask. Those are in the hands of a Collector. Unfortunately, they're too fragile to travel anymore. I saw them three years ago, uh, Monster Mania, um, gentleman brought them along. Um, it was just amazing to see the original Chatterer mask. It's so thin now because all the uh, sponge, uh, the latex foam has deteriorated yes. uh, so much. But yeah, no, sadly, I don't actually have them. But people give me boxes and, uh, and so on. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying about the latex, I mean, they, they were never built to last, were they? So basically what people do now, they kind of shove them with foam and stuff to kind of uh, preserve them, I believe. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, of course, now mostly it's, uh, as far as I understand, it's silicone that they use rather than the original latex foam that we were covered in. And the only reason that Chatra and Butterball survived was because they weren't actually stuck to our face. Uh, Pinhead, female Cenobite, uh, and Kinski, those pieces were literally all glued to the face um, and then had to be peeled, and they could only use them once. Um, they're destroyed during the process of removing them. Um, but because Chatra just kind of slid over my face like a palaclava um, with a slit down the back, um, that's why it still survives. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, the reason that I asked is because um, a friend of mine owns a, a prop store, and not long ago, uh, one of Doug Bradley's test pinhead appliances came up for sale. And um, I, I don't think he, he ever wore it. Maybe it was just like a slip on just a test, like a screen test, you know, mask or something like that, perhaps. But uh, I'll have to send you a link and uh, I'll just... Oh, you know, fascinating. Uh, yeah, he always gets little uh, horror props here and there. So I thought if any chatterer stuff is lying around, I'll, I'll definitely let you know <laughs> if uh, anything comes up. I, as far as I know, the costume and the makeup are all in the hands of one collector. Um, who's occasionally has been very generous about sharing photographs and so on when people have asked me what so how does this get made up and so on um, he's sent me across some great photographs of actually how the, the makeup what it looks like now so that people can see the detail of it okay so um, moving on to the next question your IMDB <laughs> page Nicholas yes full of independent up <laughs> Full of them, absolutely full. Of Bally Rectory, we've got that one. We've got the Haunted. Is that the one with Eileen Dietz? No. no. Oh, yes. Yes. No. You know, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, we're saying no. That's right. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, they should be shooting that one in June. I, I think. wasn't a hundred percent because I did watch the interview that you did with Eileen, but I couldn't remember if it was the Haunted or she was doing Bally. But no, it's Haunted, and you're filming in Wales. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. Yeah. That's we're filming at the studios in uh, Cardiff. I don't remember what I had for tea yesterday, but I remember an interview that you did a few <laughs> days ago. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. But and then also you've got an upcoming movie called Exhibits. Now is there anything that you can disclose from Exhibits or are we still all under NDA contract obligation? We're still all under NDA. God I'm damn it, Nick. <laughs> I want that money back. <laughs> I, I I believe we're still all, I'm assuming we're still under NDA. Um funny enough, I was having an email conversation about this very thing. Where are we now? We're the end of April. Certainly in the next month, by the end of May, we should be able to announce properly. Um, it's very exciting, I can tell you that much. I'm really stoked. I've been working really hard with a lot of other very talented people um, on uh, exhibits. And uh, yeah, I think it's going to be very, very exciting. Yeah, I mean, uh, I got asked about this in an interview the other day. I was like, are you working on exhibits? I was like, nah, I can't really say anything, to be honest with you. It's just it's just going to be a film, isn't it? It's like, <laughs> I can't really disclose anything. No, no, really can't say anything about it. And uh, yeah, no, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, that, everything that, yeah. What? I don't even want you going to the IMDb page at the moment yet until we're absolutely ready. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, yeah, I can twist that around. I mean, films like Bawley and obviously The Haunted. I mean, is, mm. it, is it nice that people still come to you and say, Nick, we want you to be a part of our movie? It, absolutely. It, it's, 
when I was interviewing Eileen Dietz, and, which is based on her book, um, Exorcising My Demons, which is basically her biography, there was one passage, passage that struck me particularly. All actors feel that there is nothing like that moment when somebody says, we want you. Nothing, there is no feeling like it. Um, obviously, that's closely followed by the terror of, oh, my God, can I do this part? Am I going to be able to, you know, can I remember all the lines or whatever it is? Um, but that moment where somebody, you know, acknowledges that they want to work with you and that they think you're talented, that you can do something like that. I mean, I'll, you know, I can still remember vividly the phone call I got from Clive when he said, you know, and he, he invited me to do the chatterer so vividly. I can still remember the phone call I got when I was told I got a part that gave me my equity card. Um, those things are really, really important to actors. I think, you know, it's, you have to develop a hard skin because most of the time you're surrounded by a world of no. Um, they don't want you. You do an audition and it doesn't happen. So those moments when somebody says, yeah, they want you, that, that really is great. I suppose it's nice to have a speaking role as well, other than chattering your teeth. <laughs> I, bet, I bet it's like, I can talk now. I'm free. Well, I did this little three. I mean, the first time I returned to acting after like a 25 year, nearly 30 year break, no, 25 year break, uh, was when I did Metamorphosis for uh, Robert Nevitt, um, which was then, it was planned as an entry for the ABCs of Death, too. It was really nice. And it was like, Oh, I'm speaking. Oh, I'm speaking all the time. Oh, gosh, this is only three pages long, and I've got dialogue on every page. Um, and it was great. It was kind of like, oh, I remember. This is why I went to drama school for three years. <laughs> <laughs> Worked on my voice, etc. Not to knock the chatter at all. I mean, like, so, you know, as you said earlier on, it's a huge part of my career and life, and I'm very, very grateful for it. Yeah, I mean, a personal question that I wanted to ask you, oh. I mean, in terms of, of acting and, and obviously uh, script reading and stuff, Mm. I've, I always think this of any actor. How on earth do you remember lines? I, I just can't comprehend. Is it broken up into segments that are shot and you just remember segment by segment? I know some people memorize whole scripts. I mean, what kind of works for you? It, it's very interesting. There's lots of different methods used by lots of different actors. I know actors who actually deliberately don't read the entire script. They only read the pages on which they appear. Um, for me, it is just a question of repetition. Um, I had to learn an awful lot for something recently uh, called The Hollower, um, which is coming out from Myco Entertainment, hopefully, I think, sometime in summer. And that was, it was, it was a long day. It was just me, and I was playing a detective. Um, and uh, it was just a question of you just keep on repeating it, and then you close your eyes, and can I remember it? And then you read it, close your eyes, can you remember it? What I always do as a script is underline things in red, and I kind of, my brain now knows that if it's underlined in red, I have to remember it. Um, so it's just a question of habit and just repetition. Just keep on having to do it again and again and again. Okay, I'll definitely keep that in mind should uh, any acting jobs pop up in the future. <laughs> God knows why they'd want me to do it. Before <laughs> you never say never. Never say this never. This is true. I could play a good crazy person. I know that. <laughs> definitely pull that off but i don't know if that split personality disorder i was just very convincing acting i'm not quite sure <laughs> but yeah i'm just going to wrap it up right there nick i mean thank you so much for joining me on the show it's always a pleasure speaking to you i i wish you all the best with the the future products but um a project sorry but I, i'm working on them with you so it doesn't make much sense for me to say that <laughs> so, uh, so yeah thanks yeah, for, yeah, no. <laughs> thanks for coming on the show nick i'm sure we'll kick some ass <laughs> and uh yeah thank you very much for for joining me and for going and staying on longer than uh, I actually told you. Ten minutes turned into 30. I do apologize. No, no, no. That's me giving long, long answers. <laughs> uh, thank you, Sean. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me on. It's been enjoyable.